of Dan Does Data. We're back from our winter break. And I'm going to jump right back into working on modeling problems. I know we had a couple weeks where we were looking at different kind of tools. Uh, but the feedback from people said, we like looking at applied problems. I like looking at applied problems, too. Uh, they often take more than one episode is the problem. So tonight, we are going to look at NVIDIA's autopilot model. And I found out about this through a GitHub implementation of a TensorFlow uh, model for autopilot. Autopilot is NVIDIA's uh, model for self-driving cars using end-to-end -end learning. So they're trying to teach the car how to do everything from start to finish uh, using self-driving cars. And it's NVIDIA is right in, right in New Jersey, uh, where I'm at, so that's cool. It's, they're in a really cool uh, facility that used to be uh, owned by Bell Labs back in the day. So I want to try to implement this, and I'm sort of going to be following along the TensorFlow implementation, but we'll be implementing it in Keras, hopefully to making it a little bit easier. I suspect what we're going to find is you can implement the model just fine, but NVIDIA has their own special data, has their own data, I wouldn't call it special. Uh, but they have their own data, and it's probably quite a bit of data. And I wonder how the person who implemented this, if they, the data has been made available, or if this is an official. Download the data set. And how big is the data? Probably big. Whoops, there's a problem with this preview. I don't want to download. I want to know what it is. So they have a paper on archive you can check out. As I said, it's end-to-end -end learning for self-driving cars. This came out not quite a year ago. And I'm sure they've been doing more work since then. Um, I've checked out some of their videos online just showing the car driving. It was pretty cool. And they talk about some of the classic uh, systems like Alvin, the autonomous land vehicle in a neural network, which Deep Drive also referenced. And of course, the DARPA programs of the past decade or so, trying to build an autonomous vehicle that can sort of navigate the wilderness or something. Ah, so here's sort of what their system is. It's using only the the camera, as it looks like, and it's just trying to figure out steering. So it's not not trying to do everything, but it's I think it's just literally this information and literally controlling that out. Adjust for shift and rotation, recorded steering wheel angle. Oh yeah, they record this. I think even with another camera, it might be. But yeah, the, at the end, it's sort of something like this. You have your camera, you take the neural network, and it tells you how to drive. And they take their data, they jitter around, and they rotate their data using their different cameras, and they train using this. And so that's how they're trying to drive, which is very similar to what we're trying to do. So what are we actually going to implement? We're going to implement this big honking model here. God, I hate, I hate that so many academic papers, uh, they put the inputs at the bottom. I feel like the only sensible thing is to have the inputs at the top and you flow down. I just, that's the way I read. I don't think it makes sense to start with this. But what, that's just a personal thing. Uh, so they've got three input planes, three at 66 times 200. So I believe that's three colors, an image that's 66 tall by 200 wide is my guess. That's my guess. They normalize all these probably to be between like zero and one. And then they're going to go through a whole bunch of convolutions. They flatten it out, and then they go through some dense neural network layers, and then they're trying to control how do we steer. So for the steering, there is one question of how. One second, let me open up the chat window. I realize I haven't done that. Apologize for anyone who's been yakking at me in there. Uh, so. How do they normalize? Is it zero and one? Is it negative one and one? I don't really think it's a big, big deal. It'd just be good to know how they do that. And to help me with this, I might just look at the TensorFlow implementation. So for me, this is almost easier, almost easier to read, just this. Because A, the first layers after the input come at the top in the code. So I know this is the first thing I need to worry about. So I know this is a five by five window with three channels in and 24 kernels out. And if we look at the paper, we'll see the same thing here. Five by five kernel, 24. And they tell you what the uh, new size is. So it's probably two by two 
Max pulling. That would give me 33, wouldn't it? Interesting. Oh, no, no, no. You lose the last one. Weird. Uh, yes. I think they're doing the kind of thing... Yeah. Well, whatever. That is what it is. Anyway, I like reading the, the code here. I find that pretty easy to do. And in Keras, it's going to be even easier to understand what happens. I think. Uh, this last function is the one... Scale to the arctan. So he's multiplying the arctangent by 2. I gotta remember arctan. Arctan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Inverse trigonometric functions. Da, da, da. Arctan, show me arctan. Arctan, arctangent. 0 and pi. They're scaling by 2. Oh, that's arc cotangent, my bad. So it's negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Interesting. Okay. Arctan x. Sine of arctan x. What if I just wanted... Huh. Okay. So I'm not 100% sure on how they're, they're coming up with the, the output function here. You know what? Let's just jump into the code. I've been yakking about this long enough. Uh, this code over here is just some initial inputs that I have from my other, my deep drive based model. We're just going to grab some of that. So our image is a different size. That's, that's just the way it is. I've rescaled all my images to be this uh, 64 by 64 because I like squares and makes everything a little bit more convenient. So it's not going to be exactly the same model. So A, we're going to be using different data. I'm just going to use the deep drive data because that's what I have. And that's easy and I already have it done. And my images are going to be different sizes. But we're going to try doing the same kind of construction. And we'll see what we end up with. 64 times 1 by 18. Interesting. And so we'll use the same topology and the same activations. Which I think is just ReLU all over the place. Yeah, ReLU. Nothing, nothing too fancy there. Um, and actually, I don't even need a fancy, I could say model equals, I don't need a fancy uh, object. I can just use a care sequential model. Let's grab all this stuff. Load in the sequential let keras load, because it's got to load NumPy. So do I even need to do this? Not necessarily. Tell you what, I'm going to open up my friend Isaac's model because he used the sequential stuff. And I think he did a very good job of that. Just like for reminding myself, oh wait, how does the how does the structure actually work in the code? I'm not doing drop out. We are just doing convolution 2D. Just so I remember how it works. All right. And then what is the word? So it's going to be 24, no, 24 kernels, 36, 24 and then 36 at 5 by 5. And 48 as well. Looks like there's three 5 by 5 layers. Let's check the TensorFlow implementation and see what they have. TensorFlow, 5 by 5 with 24 kernels, 5 by 5 with 36, 5 by 5 with 48. So that's what we got. That is what we need to implement. So, 24, have I already forgotten? Almost. 5 by 5. 5, 5, border mode, same. Yeah, I think that's right. Today, weight variable, bias variable. Truncated normal. No, oh, interesting. They use the truncated normal. Uh, com duty padding valid. Not same. Huh. All right. I dig that. And I really use com two d. Right. Oh, what is this stride here? 
Da, 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 con 2D2, stride of 2, as expected. Wait. The stride is 2 even in the... No, no, that's just for the, the padding part. Are they not doing max pooling? They have to be. They almost have to be. We're gonna we're gonna investigate this. I could have sworn they would have needed to do another max pooling uh, layer. I don't I don't recall if TensorFlow Con 2D builds that in. What does it do with TensorFlow? Hey, what do you know? That's not really what I want. I want to just look at the. I guess that's fine. 2D convolution given this yada yada yada. Right, so this doesn't do the max pooling. Huh. So maybe they don't have that. I was very surprised. I thought that was standard almost all the time. You'd see convolutional error followed by max pooling. That's wild. Wild. If I'm missing something obvious, anyone please yell out. Let me know how, how stupid I'm being. All right. Well, we're just going to press on with that then. We're not going to do max pooling. That makes life a little easier. I guess that might be why they're doing border mode valid and things like that. Uh, let me look at convolution 2D to make sure I got the stride correct. Number rows, num column, weights, regularization, arguments. There's got to be something else here. Do, 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 do. Subsample. Factor by which the subsample output. Also called strides. There we go. So we do need to subsample. Subsample equals two. I believe two pole length two. Two comma two. Almost certainly. We are just gonna try that. See how that goes. And yeah, an activation rel u is fine. Can I just build the activation into this? It would save me a little bit of effort. Can I do that? I can. So we'll just say activation right here equals ReLU. And we don't even need this. Don't need that, don't need that, don't need that. I will need that later. We will have to flatten all this stuff at the end. Okay. So there goes 24, 36, 48, right? Double check one more time. The nature of the beast. You just gotta always keep checking this stuff. There's a limit to what you can keep in your memory. 24, 36, 48. And then we switch to two uh, three by three guys that are both 64 kernels. So the window size is three by three. Three, three. So you're competing little features. 64 tiny little features. Do that twice. And I wanna double check the TensorFlow code here. Da, da, da. 3, 3, 64, 3, 3, 64, yes. Rel U at each one. And then, what is this? Weight variable, bias, oh, then he flattens, yes. Yep. That we can work on, we flatten. And then we'll say model.add dense. How many we want here? 11, hang on, let me just hang on. Da, 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 1164. There we go. And I have to remember activation equals ReLU. I believe you can get away with that. Let's add all these other things first. Let us do this. Nope, didn't like that. Start back here. First one, activation. I really could have sworn I could have was allowed to say, fudge, put this in the wrong place. There we go. That's what I get. That is what I get, man. All right. Now I'm gonna remove the old extra parentheses. There we go. Classic problem. Input shape, right. That's important. 
First layer in a sequential model must get an input shape line. Yes, it will. Interesting that I got away. Oh, he had to drop out right away. Interesting. So let me steal the input shape line here. Change it. Change the color scheme. I like. I should change my default color scheme. I've not done that yet. I really, really should. So the input shape is there, and it will be three colors: red, green, and blue. Followed by n rows, 64 rows, and n columns, 64 columns. I think this will work. We won't have very much left at the end though, because we're, we're subsampling by two each time. We're doing that five times. Uh, so there's not going to be very many features left. Let's find out. And then let's just say model.summary to see at that point what do we have left. Output shape, 64, comma, 0, comma, 0. Yeah, that's the rough part. This is 30, comma, 30. When did that happen? Even though it's like, I would think, oh, it's five by five and it's only valid. So it's 64 minus five is 59, essentially divide by two. But I get the last one there. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. So that's why it's 30 there. So how did they get 31? Well, they're at 66. They have one more, one more blurb than I do. I see, I see. Let's see. I have another file where I read in the data and muck around with it a lot, sort of like in place. I could just use a different data file. Do, 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 do. Where's the actual data here? Yeah, I do terrible things to the data here. This resizes the whole thing. Hmm. I could change the valid. That might be enough. To same. So I'm already changing all kinds of things here. Let's see. Make a new model. Add our lines. Do model that summary. Right, because I had smaller images, yes, now I've got a 2x2 two two image at the end. Whereas they had a 1x18. Ah, so when they flatten, it's 1x18x64. By by that's interesting. So that's why they did that. Sort of the way they did. Huh. Well, that's cool. So I'll have 64x2x2 by two by two sort of left over. And yeah, I'm going to have a few extras because I'm doing the same instead of the valid. I'm really not too worried about that. Uh, let's flatten. If you model that summary now, you see at the end, none comma 256, because it's 64 times two times two is how many things we got to work with. Uh, whereas they have 11 something something, 1152. Feels like such a oh, because that's three by three by sixty four by sixty four. No, that's not right. No, eleven fifty two is. Oh well, whatever. Right, it's the eighteen. Right, right. Losing my mind, losing my mind over here. Uh, so let's still do that. So already the model is like very different, even though it's got a similar topology. We literally have just a different number of input variables over here. So that's that's going to change things. But I want to see how, how far I can take this, how much I can get away with. 150, then 10. You don't think they arrived at those uh, with a rigorous method, did they? It's the kind of thing that uh, it's like, oh, well, I know this doesn't make a big difference. And then their final activation. So, they're trying to get a number. Evaluation, autonomy. On road test, visualization of the internal state. No, 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 that's not what I'm interested in. That's overview of the Dave 2 system. 
too specific. Shown in figure two, images are fed into a CNN, which computes a proposed steering command. It'd be nice if in the, here they listed the formula for what they're saying the steering is. Would have been a nice thing to have. Dave 2 driving a Lincoln. What is this? Is this a video? Yeah, it's a video. Dave 2, Dave 2. Alright, well, we'll check this out. A tan, eh? That's just so strange. That's just such a strange, strange activation function. Oh, yeah, that's not a website. Such a such a strange website. Computes a tan of LMIs. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, that's that's real cute, pal. Not a very helpful health page. I bet this is gonna be the same. Yeah. All right. Well, what is arc tangent? Keras dot arc tan. First result to one of my videos. That's also not helpful. Add more trigonometric functions to the back end. This is five days ago. Someone, someone might be trying to do the same thing that I'm doing. Should be added if it doesn't bloat the back end. Yada yada yada. They're working on this. Either way, this means that it's almost certainly not available in the version of Keras that I have right now. And I'm all about doing things right now, so. So let's just see what we can do here. This is just the arctan of a dense layer, I think. Multiplied by two, I guess. K dot A tan, is that a thing? No. <sighs> There's tan, there's tan H. That is not the same. Let me look at Arctan again. It's like I just need to see the picture of Arctan plotted. Graph of Arctan, that's perfect. Okay, I can probably get away with some hyperbolic tangent or something then. That's what this is telling me. Because tan H, well, tan H doesn't look the same necessarily, does it? Tan H is a little more aggressive. Lots of sigmoid functions. Short for sigmoid colon. No. No, well, sigmoid doesn't have the same negative trait. Plot of the air function. Erf. Welcome to Earth. Oh, I see. 2 over pi arctan of stuff. So arctan, the red one here, whereas sigmoid is related to the air function, I guess? That doesn't sound right. That does not sound right. 1 over 1 plus e to the blank. I guess very similar to tan h. So you can do this. I think we're just gonna we're gonna have to use tan h here. That's that's what we're gonna do. So model dot add dense. We're predicting one number. Activation equals tan h. Because I do not think I can get away with a tan. Yeah, no. Where the shot? Tan h over eminently acceptable. Okay. Uh, that's the whole model. I need to compile this baloney. Grab my data. Uh, optimizer. Alright, what optimizer are they using out of curiosity? Again, this shouldn't matter too much. Run, run data set, model. Oh, train, 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 train. 
What about self-driving trains? Maybe that'd be even easier, because you just gotta go, do I go, do I stop, do I switch here, do I not? Uh, they're using Adam. Okay. So we will do the same thing. Uh, and we're we'll add one, one E4, they say. So we will try that. I want two. I think it's two. That was data. Yes, it is two. Oh, well, it's not big apparently. So I get I renamed all my thing my things all the time. There we go. Let's get some data. Boom. Uh, I loaded my compiled my model. So now it's just a matter of model.fit. Got some stuff there. It's always your inputs, which is just going to be the images and the outputs, which is going to be targets. Colon, comma, zero, right? Except those are between zero and one, 10 H's. So targets, colon, comma, zero, not minus 0.5, oh boy. Times two, minus 0.5, minus one. There we go. So that when it is zero, it will be negative one, and when it is one, it will still be one. Uh, Num FX ten. Well, we'll see how long this actually takes. All right, so it only took us thirty minutes to implement that model. Again, five layers of convolutions. Then you flatten out what you have remaining. These four layers of dense neural networks, and then like the final, essentially linear regression kind of thing. That's that's their whole. That's the model. So there's nothing. There's nothing really magical about this model. I mean, not to knock the model, that's, that's good. Simple models are, are better. I find it interesting they have a little score for autonomy here. The number of interventions that they have to make. That's just kind of cool. Comfort. Well, that's interesting. Speed precision, position precision, autonomy, 100%. That's cool. That's a simulator. That's impressive. I should not be surprised that the graphics card company has excellent graphics. Like this is simple but still helpful. Like where are you in the lane? How far are you gone? How far are you gone? Or how far do you have left to go? That's neat. Like recorded test drive videos and time synchronized steering commands. Yep. Those are the things that you need. What about deep drive autopilot? Has someone done this with deep drive? Deep drive on autopilot technology? No, no, no. All right, no, I don't see a lot. If it's not in the first five results, clearly it, it can't be there. Uh, da, da, what do we got? This isn't terrible. For a little bit of training here, I'm gonna let this finish one epic probably, and then we'll we'll take a look at some of the results just to see how it's going. So we'll have our predictions against the... So we'll times two minus one again to that. No, I get a better idea. I will... Add one and divide by two. So I'll rescale them all to be between zero and one for a comparison with my outputs. Uh, because when I'm going to make a pretty picture, I will want that to. I don't want to have to keep multiplying my saved data. I'd better just look at their their input. So we have another minute here uh, to finish one epic. I know this mean squared error isn't really 
isn't that terrible, I can tell. Uh, especially since the values are sort of the scale is twice as large as it had been. And I think that's especially impressive because it's the, there was this two by two when all the convolutions are done. So let me rephrase this. The narrowest point in their model, right here is 64 times one times like 18. Uh, and that's like 1152 uh, values, so to speak. Whereas in the model that I have going on, it's going to be uh, 64 times four, 256 values. So less than a f one fourth the size. We pinched because I'm dealing with a smaller input. In fact, I'm dealing with a smaller input that's about one fourth the size, slightly less than one fourth the size. So we should not be surprised at all that my uh, position here, the pinch point in the model is one fourth of the size because this is about, all right, eh, yeah, it's a little more than, than a quarter, I guess. All right, so it got through one. That's, that's, not, that's not terrible. That is not terrible. I want to reemphasize. All right, I'm totally going to interrupt that. W equals model dot git weights. I just like to do that. Look at the weights. Just say like, yeah, yeah, those are some weights, sure. Sure, sure, sure. They don't look crazy. And model dot predicts. Images. There we go, it'll take a while to predict. Make the predictions for all the data points that we put in. Yeah, this always takes forever. And these models are somewhat large. I mean, a few, I guess there's a few million parameters. Maybe not, no, nah, maybe not that many. These convolutions really cut down the size. But this, theirs is a thousand to a thousand, so that's like a million. Mine's like 256 to a thousand. So, a quarter million at this, this layer. And that's a thousand to a hundred. So that's another hundred thousand. All right, maybe not, maybe not that many. Maybe there's half a million parameters in my model, and like a little over a million in theirs, which is not crazy, not crazy for a, a serious model. It's that, that first dense layer, that's what always kills you. So how did they come up with 1164? I wonder if that's uh, defined here. Network architecture. Signed informed teacher connection, empirically through a series of experiments. Yeah, 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 they tried a bunch of stuff, this made sense. Ah, so I see what happened here. So what you have here, the green represents the actual steering. The blue represents the model predicted steering. I've seen this kind of behavior before um, in other models. Now you'll notice this model doesn't like to steer too aggressively because it knows if it stays in the middle, uh, it's just it's not going to get penalized all that bad, frankly that it can only be hurt so much if it's in the middle. It says, no, I'm not that far off. So that's, that's amusing. It's hard to gauge here how it's actually doing. Maybe if I don't plot with dots, I plot with lines, that might be helpful. Let's try that. Let's use lines. That might be a little easier. Oh yeah, that's oh yeah, that's so easy to understand. Look at that. Clearly, you can see exactly what's going on, right? Right. Um, you know what? I should plot these in the opposite order, perhaps. I should have fixed that a long time ago. Let's plot the actual first. But, uh, mm, yeah. There we go, a little more sensible. So now the green is the model and the blue is the actual. And I'm just trying to see when the actual is like very large, is the model doing the right thing? So part of this 
is you can see, okay, yes, the model is actually not doing crazy here. It's doing sensible things. It's just missing these huge outliers. And a lot of those huge outliers are the data is really strange in those situations. Not always. But it's actually tracking it not terribly. This is better than I thought, honestly. Up and down and up and down. It's not hitting up all these all these things. Uh, but you know what? Maybe that's making for a smoother ride. What if we just zoom in on this? That is not as illuminating as I would have wished. But what I hope is illuminating is a little video. Is if I turn off auto indent. Maybe that'll be illuminating. There we go. So the green is the actual and the red is the model. And you can see the red doesn't deviate so much from the, the interior here. It's just a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. And there's just key places where the actual traffic. And I guess, no, that's just like serious turns. And like little discontinuities. Um, and it drives on the same road several times. It's kind of a weird, weird data set like that. Like, but there's different cars in the way sometimes. You see it's anticipating that left turn and this left turn, that right turn. Maybe it's just a little more gentle, in fact, because this this car, this is not not great driving, necessarily. It's kind of back and forth all over the place. Maybe not the kind of driving we want to learn. This actually, this isn't as bad as I thought it was. So I'm I'm actually reasonably happy with seeing this. Which is kind of neat. I could watch this kind of thing all day. So that's all I really wanted to try to see how that autopilot model did and uh, what was up up with that. And so I'm glad that that nominally worked, even though I had to make certain compromises, uh, like changing the the border mode here. That's not going to be a super big deal. It just means you might find some features on the edge that are dominated by just a couple pixels. Uh, rather than looking at a whole pixel. And I, I found it interesting that uh, they didn't use max pooling itself, they just did the subsampling. So they just said, all right, well, just do this and then only take every other guy or something. So that was, that was interesting. Unless the subsampling has that built in, I don't think it does. No, no, no. This kind of convolution means find something for this blob and then move over and find something for the blob next to it. So you're going to computer feature here and then computer feature here. Whereas in a normal, if you're not, if your stride is like one, you'll computer feature here and then you'll move over one pixel and compute another feature. Here you're moving over two pixels rather than one. So I imagine that's something that they tried a bunch of different things and they found, oh yeah, this, this seemed to work best. And I'm not going to begrudge them for that. 1164. That's. Maybe I should read this paper more carefully and find out. Like, where does 1164 come from? Oh, and their input image is split in totally different planes. That's interesting, too. So I'm using RGB. They're using, like, luminescence. Um, and it's a different color space, totally. One that doesn't necessarily make sense to, to humans. Not that RGB really makes sense. All right, well, that's an interesting difference. I'm glad that this model worked out pretty well. And I think we are pretty much gonna call right there. I'll leave it to the audience for a couple questions for a couple minutes, maybe not even that long. And I wanna thank everyone for coming out tonight. I'm glad that we were able to come back in the new year, uh, jump right back and do a model and that this actually worked. And you can see like in Keras, this model is like very, very quick to implement. Uh, even though I had to make certain compromises on like the activation, you can make your own custom activation functions. I chose not to go into that here right now. Uh, but the whole model sort of fits in here that much. Uh, the TensorFlow model, which is pretty compact, uh, well, this isn't it. It's only, it's a little bit larger. It's a little bit more unwieldy in code. And you've got to specify by hand certain things. Like, oh, this convolution has 24 add on the bias variable. 
oh, you have to add, repeat that 24 here, that kind of thing. You've got to specify uh, the function sort of every time. There's good reasons for that, so you can have sort of more precise control over what's going on uh, before a relatively straightforward model like this. Like, to me, this impedes understanding because there's all these extra lines. Whereas in Keras, I can see it all on one screen and on like each line. And if I zoom in, boom, now it's it's almost instantly clear. I can just read down, oh, the convolutions are 24, 36, 48, with a bunch of five by fives. Then you switch to two layers of convolutions that are three by three windows. Oh, you got the subsample thing going on. That's different. You're using ReLUs for all your activations. Then you flatten, then you get a bunch of dense layers of decreasing size. So you're sort of condensing that information down. That's, that's all that I think. Oh, this would totally just be Adam. Yeah, whatever, it's fine. So, I really like Keras. I think it's good for this kind of model. Uh, it's especially good while you're just iterating to figure out what the solution is. So if I, I wanted to change something, I want to say, no, 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 1164, that's wrong. It should be uh, like 512. Clearly, that's, you know, that's easy to change. And then I can come down here, compile a new model, and delta fit. And boom, that's, that's all the effort I had to do to change part of the model. And like, setting up this model was very simple. Granted, once a model is set up in another language, it's probably also very easy to change. But I particularly like Keras. I'm not paid to, to say that. I particularly like Keras for how easy it is to do these kinds of straightforward things. The custom things take a little more effort, probably a little bit more than they would in like TensorFlow, uh, but I still think it's often worth it. That said, uh, TensorFlow does have its own uh, higher level interfaces called like TFLearn or SKFlow it used to be called. I will probably be looking at one of those in the future again. I had looked at SKFlow in the past. Uh, so we'll see what TFLearn is, and maybe we'll do the same thing in TFLearn. That'll be an easy uh, gauge of how complicated is it. All right, I think that's all we got for tonight. So I am going to leave you guys. Thanks again for coming out. Happy New Year. Stay safe in the data mines.